Welcome to another edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. I am John Schmelk. The other man on your screen, if you're watching this, is Jeff Risden. He covers the draft for Real GM. Thank you for being with us. It's all brought to you by PSEG, energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Now, for the folks out there, if you haven't been listening to our draft season podcast with Tony Pauline, you probably don't have a great feel for this draft class in general yet. I do encourage you, go subscribe to draft season. But for those of you that only listen to the Giants Huddle, Wanted to bring in Jeff, who's been with us doing draft stuff for years, uh, to kind of give us an, an overview of the class and what the Giants would be looking for kind of at that end of the first round area with that 25th pick in round number one. Jeff, we were just talking about uh, the Senior Bowl is what, your 14th or 15th time down. You've been doing this a long time. Uh, it, it's good to be back in the saddle here. This is going to be aired after the Super Bowl, and now it's it, it's all about the offseason. It is, and it'll God bless the off season. It's it's time, and you know normally when we're talking, we're talking about the Giants being in the you know picking in the eight to fifteen range. Uh, we're in the twenties this year, and that that's that's a nice refreshing change for y'all. I'm happy for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a little tiring without any break between you know a second round playoff appearance and and the draft process, but we've gone through it. We're there, and you're right. It is nice. We're not talking about the Giants last year. They had two top ten picks, Jeff. So a little bit different this year, which would be fun. Of course, we'll probably catch up with Jeff again at the combine, do some combine specific stuff. But for now, let's talk about this class, Jeff. Give me your twenty thousand foot view of the class this year. You know, strengths, weaknesses, compare it to past classes. How do you see the twenty twenty three draft class? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think it's not as top heavy as some other classes. I think the talents that are at the very top, uh, it, it's shallow up there. But I think the the strength, and, and, and John, you and I saw it when we were in Mobile. I think the strength is day two into early day three. Uh, I, I think the players in that middle core, specifically at some positions, uh, tight end sticks out, running back sticks out. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot, of, a ton of cornerbacks, which I think is the best position in the draft. Um, they're good up top. They're also good in the middle. Uh, it, it's, you know, God bless teams that need uh, quarterback help. Uh, I, I think they're, I, I like the quarterbacks at the, at the top in general, but uh, there are very realistic questions involving all of them. Uh, and I think at the tail end of the draft, I don't think it's a very good draft deep this year. Uh, the guys are going to be taken in the, in the sixth and seventh rounds. It's going to be one of those where they got to find the right place and the right fit more than it's a talent that that's, you know, just waiting to be unearthed. Uh, it's kind of an, an interesting draft from that standpoint. It's it's different than than last year, where I think we saw you know the top of the draft was fantastic, uh, and that's been the case in a few of the last years where you've seen you know transcendent talents who are going to fit in any team in any scheme don't necessarily have that much this year with with a couple of notable exceptions, and that makes the top of the draft that much tougher to predict this year. All right, so then broadly speaking, and I think you probably mentioned one of the positions you're going to hit here, but I'll ask it to you open-ended when the Giants are picking at 25 where are you going to find value position wise a cornerback absolutely uh and uh man there's there are so many good corners uh for all different types of schemes teams um inside outside uh hybrid guys uh there's an incredible value there I do think that you're getting into the, the that range offensive line is decent uh, I, I don't see any top end prospects but the, that that cluster of guys that includes uh, you know, guys like Peter Skaronsky, um, John Paul Schmitz at center, uh, uh, Osiris Torrance. I think that's the the sweet spot for those guys as well. So if you're in need of offensive line help, um, either inside or outside, you can probably get a pretty good value right there too, because those guys all have the potential to be significantly better than those than that draft range. Uh, but I don't really see more than one of those guys going before then either. All right, so let, let's let start digging into positions here now. And you've mentioned cornerback, and I think probably more cornerbacks will be taken in the first round, Jeff, than maybe any other position. Maybe pass rusher will be in that neighborhood as well. How many corners do you think could go in the first round? And, and who are some of the guys you like that would fit that Wink Martindale scheme where he wants fast guys that are long and can play press man? You just described Christian Gonzalez perfectly. Uh, I don't. Think I love this tape there. too, man. He can make plays on the ball. Whoo! Yeah, uh, th th there's so many good corners this year. So, uh, you know, and so the team that I cover, the Detroit Lions, happens to need a cornerback, and they're picking at 6-18. and 18, uh, And it wouldn't be terribly shocking if they drafted two of them. That that's that's how good this class is. Yeah, guys like uh, Devon Witherspoon, uh, Joey Porter Jr., who would fit very well with Wink Martindale, and he's 
I wouldn't rule out the fact that he could be there. Um, I, it would be surprising, but not completely unrealistic if he's there for the Giants. Uh, and he's uh, look when you when your dad is Joey Porter and you play cornerback, there is a certain style that precedes you. Uh, you better believe that that's something that Wake Martin did with like. Yeah, there's uh, uh, even like the hybrid guys, like a Brian Branch, who's sort of a safety slot corner type player uh, out of Alabama. I think you can see as many as seven, possibly even eight. Although I think that's pushing it in the in the first round. And man, there all these guys are talented. And there's day two guys that are going to be taken. Uh, I think a guy like Cam Smith out of uh, out of South Carolina, um, not necessarily a Wig Martindale fit, but a guy who's you know got a lot of really impressive tape of his own. A uh, guy that probably has to play in a straight zone, but you know another guy that's you know certainly talented and, and could go in the first round. There, there's it's a, it's a great cornerback class. It really is all, so all types that you need. So you're telling me Giant fans are going to be staring at that draft board from picks ten to twenty four, praying that some of these corners that they want aren't getting drafted. Is basically what you're telling me. Yeah, and and that's where you have to hope that there's a little bit of an earlier run on offensive line than than what's going to happen. Uh, maybe a couple of off-ball linebackers thrown in there. Uh, it's difficult to envision who those guys would be at this point, but uh, <laughs> you never know. Um, wide receivers. Wide receiver is the wild card position for me because uh, I don't know who the number one t- wide receiver is. I don't know who is when it's, when that person is going to be coming off the board either. You know, is is it is it Addison? Is it Johnston? Um, do they go at 12? Do they go at 20? Like that That's a wide open variable in this class that I don't think anybody has a really good feel for just yet. All right, well, I think what a great transition, Jeff, because wide receiver is another position that the Giants are going to want to add to this offseason. It's not a great free agency class, so I think you might be looking at wide receiver in the draft. You know, and I want to start with Quentin Johnson, and I want to dig in a little bit more on, on details with the individual players here. You know, I've seen Quentin Johnson be mocked in the top 10. I've seen him mocked around 15. I've seen seen him mocked at 25. You know, what's the conversation with him? Is it 6'4", 215? He has the the frame that you want. He's pretty good after the catch. So your thoughts on him and, and what evaluators are going to be questioning and looking at when they decide how much, how high you're going to draft a guy that, that really has all the traits you're looking for. Yeah, I think a couple of things that that he has working against him are that he played in the Big 12 where pass defense is not exactly notable. Uh, he, he also played in TCU in a Sonny Dykes system, uh, which schemes guys open pretty well. It also schemes easier throws for their quarterback, uh, Max Duggan, who's going to get drafted at some point too. Uh, I like him. Uh, I, I like Johnson a lot, actually. He's he's he showed the ability to get open on his own by changing speeds, by using his size pretty well. He is good after the catch. Um, I, I see some comparisons out there to Kenny Galladay, and instantly Giants fans are you know he's. I'm not saying that he's like Kenny Galladay, but frame wise he is. But as a receiver, he's much more um, live in space, much That's more sure. uh, agile. And and I think that the the ability to work over the middle is something that he's going to have uh, that you don't necessarily see out of guys his size all that well. You can line him up in the slot, and he can be your giant slot if you want to use that in your offense. And uh, you know, I I struggle with where to project him. Uh, like you said, ten is realistic, twenty five is realistic, uh, anywhere in between is realistic too. Uh, and and that's that's true of a couple of the wide receivers in this class. I like him a lot. He's I dare say he will be my number one wide receiver. I'm not done with all my evaluations yet, but uh, he right now he is sitting on the top spot. All right, Jeff, separate for me the Jordan Addisons, the Jackson Smith and Jigbas, the Zay Flowers. I'm going to throw Josh Downs in that mix. I liked his tape that much when I looked at it. And then you want to throw Jalen Hyde in there with his speed too. You can, you know, you could, you know, where they're ranked, I guess, sure, but. When you look at its skill sets between those guys, how do you kind of separate and break them out in terms of what teams should be looking for if they want that particular player? Yeah, Flowers, I, I really like to say Flowers tape. I wish he was a little bit bigger, and I wish he was just a smidge faster, but uh, he, he he's a guy that I think he can start in the slot right away uh, at the NFL level. Smith and Jigba is, uh, look, Ohio State, one of the things that they do very well at that program is they churn out guys that are ready to run routes in the NFL. Not every program does that. That that's actually one of the things that you have to watch with with Johnston and with Addison yeah. even. Uh, and he, he's going to be ready. You know, you saw Chris Olave, you saw Garrett Wilson last year. Those guys come in understanding, you know, spatial dynamics, understanding that 
Okay, when it's a nine yard out, you've got to run it the same way every time, same footwork every time. And uh, that, that that's something that, you know, if you don't have to wait on that guy, even, you know, three months of training camp where you're trying to drill that into his head, that, that's a big asset for a team like the Giants that's ready to win now uh, and needs somebody that can contribute right away. I don't so want to interrupt you, Jeff, real quick. He played mostly slot Ohio State. Do you think he can work outside in the NFL? I do, yes. Uh, it, it's going to be one of those cases where I think um, I'll, I'll hearken to uh, a guy that we have in Detroit as, as Amon Ross St. Brown. Very different type of receiver, but the concept that you can play inside but also flip outside or work in a bunch formation, uh, Smith and Jigba can absolutely do that for you. All right, you mentioned Addison. You know, I th- He's very polished. He has a ton of production. Uh, he can run away from guys. You know, to me, he's just really, really solid. How do you have him compared to, you know, Smith and Jigba? And, and, and you mentioned Flowers and, and how you think you know, the rankings will play out and where you think he's going to get drafted. Because I could easily see him being the first guy off the board. I can see him being the third guy or fourth guy off the board, too. Yeah, and I think uh, when we meet in Indy in a few weeks, it's going to be very telling for him because uh, how how speedy is his speed? Um, it looks fantastic on tape. Uh, his, and again, his ability to change speeds while he's in a route to create a little bit of separation yeah. and his ability to play the ball in the air, I think is underappreciated for a guy that has his level of production. He did it at two different schools across different quarterbacks, different offensive schemes. That's impressive to me. Uh, he's He's got a lot to like. There are times when you wonder um, when he's not the designated number one receiver on a route, is he really running it all that hard? And that is concerning. Uh, that That's something that he's going to have to answer for. But he, he's a very talented guy. Uh, and look, if it, you can bet, um, at least in Michigan, where I live, you can bet on who's going to be the number one wide receiver. And right now, he is the the odds on favorite to be the number one wide receiver taken. But uh, again, we, we got, what, two and a half months before the draft yet. Those things change. But he's certainly a guy that uh, I, I expect to be gone before the Giants pick. Okay, I'll throw two other guys at you at this position, but this is one of the positions Giant fans are really excited about. And then maybe I'll try to lock you down some of those corners too. Um, Jalen Hyatt, uh, he scares the hell out of me, Jeff. I'm not going to lie. Like <laughs> You watch him, and boy, he is fast. He runs away from guys. Like He is better speed on tape than any of the guys we just talked about. I mean, yeah. he is a blazer. But boy, you watch that Tennessee offense, and it looks nothing like what an NFL offense is going to look like. He's not going to be asked. He's going to be asked to do so much more in an NFL offense than what he did at Tennessee. And look, I think early, can you use him as a field stretcher and stuff like that? Absolutely. You know, he didn't make a ton of contested catches even deep. He was just open. And and I worry about how quickly he's going to impact the NFL game, except as a deep threat right away, because I do think the other aspects of his game really need to be developed. Yeah, he's very good at working down the field. And, you, and like you said, you can line him up right now on the outside with, with a slot inside of him or with the flexed out tight end and make it work. And he's going to be able to create space. He's going to hold those safeties. He's going to draw that zone deeper and wider, which means that if you've got a, a running back that can catch the ball out of the backfield, there's going to be a lot of room for him. you got a quarterback that can run. He's going to be able to take advantage of that. But as far as his production, yeah, there's there's a lot to, to – to look at you know he was very he was schemed open um it's not his fault and and maybe he can be a guy that gets open on his own but he's leggy for his speed uh doesn't necessarily get off the line as fast as some other guys like that uh he reminds me somewhat of will fuller coming out of notre dame except will fuller couldn't catch i i think jalen hyatt i don't have any i don't have any real questions about his hands uh, i've not seen him block uh, again it's not that i don't know that he can't but it's just that we haven't seen that he can uh, as a function of their offense. So there are definitely some questions with him. All right. The final receiver I'm going to throw at you is Josh Downs out of North Carolina, because I love this guy. Um, I watched his tape and I watched him and Zay Flowers back to back. And I know a lot of people, you know, and you included love Zay Flowers. I don't see much of a difference between the two guys. So inform me, why is Zay Flowers a, a, a much better pick than Josh Downs, a guy you might be able to get 20, 25 picks later? Yeah, I, and I think some of that is is dealing with the quarterbacks that was throwing the ball to him. Uh, you look at North Carolina, you've got the potential number one pick in the 2024 draft throwing the ball to him. You look at, at Zay Flowers and True. USFL, maybe? Maybe? <laughs> uh, th- there is a difference there. And I think the, the consistency with which the ball was delivered to Downs when and where he needed it uh, sort of takes away from his skills. I, I like Downs quite a bit. I, he has some very, very impressive tape. 
uh, especially against good good programs. I think he rose up when when the, the Tar Heels had to play a good team, and uh, that that impresses me. I like to see that. Smith and Jigba did that, by the way, too. Uh, as did uh, Ronnie Bell out of Michigan, a guy who's going to come, you know, probably fourth or fifth round uh, that we saw down in, in Mobile. Uh, th- again, it depends on how highly you want to prioritize that position, how much resources you want to spend to it, and and what sort of players you can get in lieu of him. You know, are you are you choosing between one of those in the first round versus one in the third round, and how how much does your offense use that role? Uh, I, I think for New York. I'm looking pretty prominently at that. You know, if, if I can get a guy at 25 that I want, or you know, maybe bubble up, you know, a little bit in the second round, then uh, I, I, I'm going to make that call. But yeah, Downs and Flowers, there's not a lot of separation, and you will find some draft analysts who will have Downs rated higher, uh, and I wouldn't necessarily quibble with that all that hard. Where's the big drop off at wide receiver, Jeff? Like, can the Giants wait for pick? I guess what would it be? Fifty eight. I guess it would be in, in round number two to get a wide receiver. Or at that point, are you looking at more developmental guys, guys that'll be threes or fours and not somebody that'll help you right away? Yeah, I think you're looking more than at a guy that's not going to be a big time contributor for you. You're, you're looking at a guy that's going to be your wide receiver three. I like the way you put that. Or a guy that's more one dimensional, a guy that's going to do, I'm going to be your slot receiver that runs, you know, eight yard eight yard routes, option routes all day, or I'm going to be a big receiver on the outside. That's never going to catch a pass inside 10 yards. Uh, That's sort of the, the, the choice that you're making there. So there is a bit of a drop off. Now those guys are useful. There's a lot of guys that can do either of those things that you can get at 56 or in the third or fourth round Uh, and, and will be good players, but they're not going to necessarily be the guys that really impact your coverage or, or change the way that your offense runs. All right. Makes sense. Let's go to tight end because I think a lot of Giant fans are thinking, oh, you know what? It's not the best wide receiver class, but it's an awesome tight end class. And really I think you have three or four guys, Jeff, frankly, that I think could go in the first round, maybe four or five that are deserving to potentially go in the first round. Uh, give the fans a rundown on the top of this tight end class, who you like and, and kind of what separates some of these really good players. Yeah, Michael Mayer is the top guy from Notre Dame. He is He is very polished. He is certainly worthy of a first round pick. Uh, he can do it all. Um, Notre Dame has a pretty good history of putting out tight ends that can block, uh, that, that can catch the ball, that can line up inside, outside motion across. He, he can do everything. Uh, he is certainly worthy of the number 25 overall pick. Uh, I, I wouldn't hesitate at that at all. Luke Musgrave out of Oregon State is a great athlete, pretty good blocker most of the time. Uh, in Mobile, he couldn't catch the ball, which was very strange because... I think uh, that's rust. That's got to be rust, right? I think so, yeah. Because he didn't play a lot, you know, missed basically the entire season. Yeah, uh, and, and working with different quarterbacks, I'm not going to hold that against him too much, but some of them were like, like, wow, man, have your hands ready to catch the ball. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but yeah, there, there, there's a lot of, of very impressive tight ends. If you go down a little bit deeper, we saw Payne Durham was one of the big stars down there out of Purdue, uh, looks like a do it all. Um, he might be like a, a tight end one a. I'm not necessarily sure that he's like your your alpha dog tight end, but a guy like Dalton Schultz out of the of of Dallas compares very favorably to Dalton Schultz, and and that's a guy that I think uh, I think the Giants can use a guy like that. I'm gonna throw a couple more guys out to you that I know I really like. I watched Dalton Kincaid the other day out of Utah, and yeah. I. Oddly, which we haven't gotten a lot of Jeff, I think we're getting a lot of two-way tight ends in this draft that have the size and the ability to block and catch. But I think if you're looking for more of that move tight end, that F guy, I think Dalton Kincaid runs better routes than any other tight end. He's natural catching the football. He separates. You know, if you're looking for a receiver that's going to bang right away for you, I think think I think Kincaid's your guy. Yeah, and he can he can make things happen after the catch too. Uh, and Utah's offense helps facilitate that. He's certainly a very talented player. Uh, I, I like him a lot in that that move role, and he can he can line up at fullback for you as well if you want to you know load up the backfield or go into like a right? pistol formation. Yeah. yeah, he's he's got that ability for sure. How about Sam Laporta out of Iowa? You know he he kind of has that Dalton Schultz vibe to me too, right? He doesn't have that top end speed, but I thought his route running was really good. He's quick in and out of the breaks, and you know Iowa just doesn't throw the ball a ton, so you don't know how good these guys are. Sometimes just look at Charlie Jones, right? Who had to go to Purdue and then he blows up, and I think he's going to be a really good wide receiver. So your thoughts on Laporta? And I'll even throw Tucker Craft at he out of South Dakota State, who's a small school guy, but 
boy, some of the stuff he does down the scene with his athleticism, you wonder what his upside is. Yeah, with him, you're you're thinking, is this Dallas Goddard 2.0 uh, coming from that that sort of division and that level of play and being your number one receiver as a tight end in college? You don't get a lot of that. He's worn that crown pretty darn well. So he's certainly intriguing. I want to see how his athleticism tests. I want to see him standing next to the other guys in Indy. Yeah, me too. Uh, just, you know, you know, how does he look? Uh, because there's a lot of there's a lot of football talent in that guy. Laporta, you know, Iowa tight ends, um, we've dealt with a ton of them over the years. He's different that he's not TJ Hawkinson. He's not fan. You know, he's he's uh he's a little bit more of a an inline guy. Uh I, I know they do use him as a move, and and man, their passing offense was stone age. Uh that they, they <laughs> it, it was rough, man. So he's got more more of a jump to make in terms of doing NFL tight end skills outside of blocking than what you're going to see from the other guys. But if you're in need of a guy in the, I'm going to guess he's going to go probably in the third or fourth round, depending on his athletic testing. Um, He could bubble up a little bit. He actually could fall a little bit from that too. If you need a guy that can come in and be your inline blocking tight end right away, fine. Give me that. If you're, if you need a guy that's going to, you know, go out and catch you 40 passes as a rookie, it's probably not your guy. All right, let's go over to a quarterback. You mentioned it earlier. Then we'll hit offensive line and running back here. Uh, Giants aren't really in this market, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, Jeff. But if you could just like combine Bryce Young's ability to play quarterback and then just like put him in Will Levis's or CJ Stroud's body, I mean, you, you'd basically have Trevor, like Trevor Lawrence or Andrew Luck. I mean, you'd have an elite quarterback. Is Bryce Young's size the only thing that you worry about when you watch him? Because that's the only thing I worry about. That dude looks like, you know, Drew Brees out there, the way he moves and finds angles and steps up in the pocket, creates space. He, I mean, he just bleeds special to me as long as his body can hold up. He, he's a very talented player. There's no doubt about it. Uh, his size is certainly the biggest worry. I do worry he had some struggles in the Tennessee game this year, um, in the Cincinnati game um, a year prior, and also in the LSU games both years. When, when he's pressured up the gut, he doesn't make the best decisions, and he can be late to see some routes as well. Now, now, some of that is the fact that we, we're so used to Alabama having absolutely loaded offenses where everybody on the team gets drafted. This was probably their weakest supporting cast for a quarterback in a long time, and you do have to take that into account, but he wasn't always the sharpest at making the right decision quickly uh, when under pressure. Uh, again, that, that's sort of nitpicking uh, with him. Uh, I would certainly take him over Will Levis even at his size, but uh, yeah, the, he's – He's he's really good, man. It's fun to watch him play, uh, and and he, you see him in the commercials. You see him, you know, interacting with with the players. Uh, he's got the leadership. He's got the charisma. He's got everything. It's just he's maybe five nine and a half, maybe one hundred and eighty five pounds as a playing weight. Um, when I my my suspicion is he's going to show up in India at two hundred pounds and not do anything, uh, just to show that he's that big. <laughs> Then you got to weigh that in too. You know, uh, it's it, it's a tough one for the right team with a, a very good offensive line that can protect him. Uh, he's I, I like his chances. I really do. Yeah, so do I. I he'll be one of those guys in Indy walking around with gallons of water everywhere he goes, making sure he maximizes his, his hydration so he maximizes his weigh in. No doubt about that. <laughs> All right, parse Stroud and Levis for me. Throw Anthony Richardson in the mix if you want. I think when all said and done, Levis is going to go ahead of Stroud. I think people probably just like the arm talent and the athleticism combination a little bit better for me. And and I I hate to scout helmets and I don't like doing it, but the tough adjustment for Haskins and Fields going from that Ohio State passing scheme to the NFL does worry me, to be honest with you. You have such good wide receivers there and, you know, it's just not. You know, the things they do at Ohio State, you can't do in the NFL because they're just so much more talented than everybody else. So your thoughts on kind of those three guys and then Richardson, who, I mean, I could see him going 10th. I could see him going 35th. I mean, uh, who who the hell knows? Yeah, uh, I like Stroud quite a bit more than I like Levis. And uh, some of that is the fact that, you know, I, you know, being in Big Ten country uh, and I went to high school in Columbus, I'll put that as a disclosure. I'm not an Ohio State guy, though. I'm an Ohio Bobcat. Go Cats. (laughs) Uh, Got to throw that in. Um, I like what Stroud did. I think he was a guy more than even Fields that was more constrained by Ohio State's offense. I think he can transcend what he was asked to do in Columbus. I really do. Uh, the, the physical talent is there. 
He's a very bright guy. Uh, we saw in the Michigan game, and we saw it a little bit in their bowl game, he can run. He has the athleticism. They asked him not to do it. We've seen, you know, Justin Fields was the same way, um, and he he he's going to be a, a 1,250-yard rusher next season uh, in Chicago with their brutal offensive line and terrifyingly inept wide receiving core. Uh, I, I like Stroud. I'm, I'm going to bet on him. Uh, but I do think that Levis is going to wind up going before him. For like you said, he comes from a more pro-style ready offense. He does have the physical gifts. I just worry. It, it seems like he's just sort of painting my numbers at times in that offense. Oh, my uh, God, I, Jeff. I can't believe you just used that words. On our draft season podcast, I call him a paint-by-numbers quarterback all the time. It's funny. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's a lot of that, and, and I think he, I think he can be a good quarterback. But I'm, I actually, I like Richardson, uh, and certainly Richardson's upside more. Uh, and I was on another podcast recently where I talked about his development. If you just watch Anthony Richardson in September, you're going to think that guy. Why in the world would my team draft him at all, let alone in the first round? If you watch him at the end of the season, like it wasn't a straight uphill. He had some valleys in that in there. But man, for a guy making his first career starts um, at a Florida program that isn't what Florida used to be, um, and in a, an offense that didn't always necessarily play to his strengths, man, the development that I saw from week one to week whatever was really impressive. And his athletic ability, his release, his ability to adapt to what was around him, I really like him. I'm going to bet on him as well. Uh, I don't think he's going to be there for the Giants. Not that the Giants are in the market for a quarterback, but I don't think he's going to be there at 25. I think he's going to be gone. And I will throw Hendon Hooker into this mix as well. He's probably not going to play in 2023, um, which you know obviously you know rules out a lot of things. 58 touchdowns to five interceptions in the SEC over the last two seasons. That's not an accident. That doesn't happen by a fluke. That guy is a very good precision passer. Now, again, their offense schemed a lot of things up for him, uh, and he is older. He's 25. He's going to be 26 by the time he plays in the NFL, more than likely. That's a tough sell, but, man, that's a really, really good football player. Uh, another a smart guy who can run, who can create, who can do things beyond what the structure of what he was asked to do in college. At least I believe that. Uh, I think he's a top 50 pr prospect in this draft, and I hope that he gets drafted that way. And by the way, I, I think I do think Stroud's a safer draft pick than than both Levis or uh, Richardson for sure. I think he's just so agree. accurate. He's a really accurate player. And the other the, the script I use for Levis, it looks like you took a football player that's not a quarterback and told him to play quarterback. He just doesn't. He doesn't look natural there doing it a, a lot of the time. But I'm with you. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see where those guys go. All right, let's go to running back here quick. You know, Bijan, uh, probably the best running back coming out since Saquon. Um, Agreed. Uh, say, uh, Agreed. If you're just going by grades, he's probably a top five pick, a top three pick in this draft, that good. But then, man, I mean, uh, just at the senior bowl, watching these guys, I mean, you're looking at probably six or eight guys that could go on day two. I mean, this is rich. And these are guys that I think can step in and start in the NFL right away, Jeff. We're going to have yeah. the running back core around the league just really bolstered this year with a really deep class. Who are some of the guys you like? It's, and, and his uh, Richardson's backup, Roshan Johnson, is a guy who uh, was very good at the Senior Bowl before he broke his hand and kept playing, by the way, <laughs> for the rest of the game. Um, he He's much more of your rumbler. But, yeah, Ty J. Spears down there, my goodness, electrifying open field speed uh, and the ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. Oh, man, uh, my, my head's just like awash with all the guys that are out there. There are so many good running backs. Uh, 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 McIntosh, Charbonnet, I mean, there's a million. Yeah, yeah, uh, Mac McIntosh is a great one out of Georgia. Uh, Amir uh, Gibbs, I mean, there's so many. Yeah, uh, Syracuse, um, and his name's a slip of mind, is a guy that I really like. Uh, there, there, there are so many running backs that can do whatever you want them to do. Even, even some of the, like, the guys that were at the, at the Shrine Bowl and the NFLPA Collegiate Bowl, like there's some very real talent that's going to have an impact in this league right away. It's a great year to take one. Um, if you're the Giants, let, let's assume that Saquon is back. Take a guy in the fourth, fifth round that's going to be, you know, a complimentary back. And not necessarily that the Giants even need that. But, man, it, this is a year where there are more running backs. And by the way, the free agent class is also loaded. Stacked. It's a it's a buyer's market 
for running backs. And uh, it's a great time to need running backs. Um, unfortunately, on the other end of it, you know, no country for old running backs. The the running back market, these guys aren't going to get paid what they're probably worth or drafted as high as you would think they would. Like you said, I'm fully with you. I think Bajon Robinson is the best running back prospect since Saquon Barkley. He might not even be a first rounder. Like yeah. as crazy as that sounds, he's going to be on, on the top five overall for a lot of draft boards and could be there for mine. And it, it, it's tough to project him as a top 20 pick because there's just so little, like, like what does he give you? Um, I'll, I'll use the analogy. Like he, he's a Mercedes S class. But you can lease a BMW 7 Series or an Audi A7 or the top of the line Genesis, you know, you know, you know, two di- two picks later or in free agency for much cheaper than what you can get for him. Is it really that big of a difference between what you're getting with Bajan and what you're getting with, you know, guys down the line? It, it, it's it's such a loaded class. Yeah, it really is. If you want a running back, this is a good year to, to, to be in the market for one for sure. All right, you mentioned O-line earlier, and I think the Giants, they're pretty set at tackle right now, Jeff. So I don't want to spend too much time there with Evan Neal and, of course, Andrew Thomas out there. But they could use some help inside. You mentioned Osiris Torrens, and I think we saw a bunch of potential plug-and-play inside guys at the Senior Bowl. You could talk about those guys. Any other guys that you think you know are worth mentioning inside and you know, where you think the sweet spot is for, for bringing in one of those interior offensive linemen? Yeah, there's a lot of day three guys. Uh, and we have the same need in Detroit. We need a starting right guard. Um, former giant Evan Brown is going to be priced out of our market. Uh, and, and good for him, by the way. Uh, very, very good scrappy find. Uh, if you need a starting center, he's going to be a good one that's, that's going to get paid in free agency. You know, guys like uh, uh, Broker out of Mississippi. Uh, Jarrett Patterson out of Notre Dame. Uh, uh, we saw Darnell Wright from Tennessee. I, I think he's going to, I think he's going to wind up playing tackle, but that's a guy that I would love as, as a guard. You know, we, we saw several of these guys down in, in mobile. Um, uh, McClendon Curtis from Chattanooga was the guy who really opened my eyes. Uh, I, I hadn't seen him play at all. I, I see him down in mobile and like, my goodness, that sure he looks was like good. an NFL starting guard that you can get, you know, in the 90 to 120 range. That's, that's a great spot to need a, you don't need a premium pick on a guard. If if you have one to spend, that's fantastic. You don't necessarily need it, especially when you've got a guard when when you when your tackles are set and you know you don't have to worry about their outside shoulders so much. Uh, that that's a nice luxury. So I would love for the Giants to tap into that mid mid tier market. Uh, and there's quite a few guys in there in there as well. Uh, there's uh, Ohio State has one. Michigan has one uh, in Owen Tumley. Uh, probably pegged mo- primarily as a center, and that's where he wants it. But if if you need to play him at guard, you could play him in a pinch, and he's a day two guy. So great year to need a, you know, that that middle tier interior offensive line. Yeah, Whipler, the Ohio State center, I think is the guy you're referring to. He's very yes. good. Yeah, hundred percent. Here's a question: Do you think there's a chance not one guard or center goes in the first round? Do you think either Torrance or John Michael Schmitz might kind of slide their way in there? I think Schmitz played his way into that and solidified, and he will solidify it with his weight room numbers uh, down in Indianapolis. He's really, really good. I compare him to Alex Mack. Um, he's not quite that top end of an athlete. Uh, I remember going to my first senior bowl, and Alex Mack in warm-ups on the first day did a full splits at 295 pounds and got up without using his hands. I'm like, holy crow, this is a different <laughs> world. <laughs> uh, and he's he's got a shot at, at being in the Hall of Fame someday. Uh, I'm not putting that on Schmitz, but there's a lot of stylistic similarities between those two. So I think he's going to go pretty high. Uh, I actually think he could go higher than what's expected. He could be a top 15 pick. Wow. After that, you know, Torrance, Torrance is really good. I think we saw Wright being really good. Uh, but that I, I don't think those guys... They, they could go in the 20s. They could also go in the in the 30s and the early 40s. Uh, again, because there's such a glut of guys in that next tier below it. And again, the difference between having a premium starting right guard or center and having a like B plus level um, isn't that great on your football team. Like that's not where you want your difference makers necessarily to be. So, uh, and I think the NFL is catching on to that. You know, it's great to have them if you can get them, but you don't necessarily need them to be an effective offense. Is Skoronsky a guard in the NFL? And is there any chance he gets the Giants at 25? Uh, He's got a shot at it. His arms are small. No, I know. They're short. There are. I mean, I thought they might not be. 32 inch arms on a guy that. 
at that height, that, that, you know, you're looking at, you know, the, it's not a T-Rex, but it's not exactly, you know, a pterodactyl either. If you're comparing <laughs> dinosaur arms, he's really, really skilled and well coached. And I think that's going to get him out of, I think he's going to be off the board before the Giants pick. And I do think that a team's going to try him at tackle um, and, and make him prove that he can't play tackle before they move him inside. No question about it. All right. Uh, that's the offense, Jeff, unless there's anything else you want to put out there about the offensive side of the ball before I shift over to D here. No, we're good. All right, let's let us let us let us go over to defense. Uh, let's start the outside in. We already did cornerback. So how about the safety class? You know, I think we got a good mix of guys here. We kind of see some of those safety slot combo guys um, a little bit. So uh, your idea on the class and, you know, they come in so many shapes and sizes and roles now. How you kind of separate the guys out that way? Yeah, uh, I like Brian Branch quite a bit uh, as your hybrid guy, your, your guy that can play as your slot cornerback as well as a, a, an off-ball free safety. Um, probably don't want to play a single high. Um, we saw a few guys down uh, uh, in Mobile that I thought showed out pretty well. Brown from, from Illinois is a guy. He's much more of your Jabril Peppers edge safety type of guy. Uh, not that they used – Jabril like that in Cleveland, but you know, I, I think you get the idea in New York of where he's used at his best. And and Brown reminds me of quite a bit of him. Uh, the, the ball hawk safety doesn't necessarily exist in this class, which is kind of weird. Um, and if they do, it's the lower tier guys and more developmental guys that okay, I know he's going to get four interceptions for me, but is, is he going to give up eight touchdowns? Uh, can he <laughs> tackle a tight end in space at all? Um, and th there's a lot of guys that are in that boat. Uh, and I'm still sorting through those guys. Uh, you know, but there's, it, it's a good, I, I think, class to need a developmental guy that you want to bring up in a specific role. Um, you know, the top end safety, Kyle Hamilton, isn't in this class. But uh, I'll, I'll refer to my Lions again here. They got Kirby Joseph in the third round last year. Uh, that guy's a future standout starter. And you're looking for that guy. And again, it's going to be about, can he fit into your scheme? What do you need your safety to do? Um, if you need a box safety, I'm not sure this is a great box safety class um, beyond Brown and, and a couple other guys, but uh, you know, as far as like roaming safeties, that's one where you're going to have to find the right guy for your scheme, your coach specifically, and and his mentality and his fit and exactly what you need him to do. Um, I saw a talk, I'm just getting into the safety class right now as an evaluator. I will tell you, the missed tackles from this class are fairly alarming. Yeah, and, and that's what you don't want out of a safety, right? Your last line yeah. of defense can't be missing tackles. Yeah. Safety means <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. All right, uh, inside linebacker, off ball. This is kind of, Jeff, one of the positions I think the Giants could really be targeting here. Uh, they kind of were mixing guys in and out. I mean, they, they brought Jared Davis over from the Lions at the end of the year. And I think around Christmas Eve, he started their two playoff games. That's how desperate they were for inside linebackers. So take us to the class. Is there going to be someone worth the bang for the bucket 25? Or is that something you're going to have to tackle later? Drew Sanders is a very interesting one to me. I, I like him a lot uh, coming out of Arkansas. He's a player that has a lot of upside for me um, as a guy who can pass rush and a gap blitz. Uh, he he's, he's certainly interesting. Uh, Jack Campbell is interesting out of Iowa. I like the day, day two, day three hybrid guys. Uh, Dion Henley out of Washington State is a guy that interests me. Uh, there's, I'm blanking on a couple of the other guys, but uh, it, there there are functional guys. It's a smaller class. Toa um, Toa, Overshone, Noah Sewell. Overshone is another guy. Um, I, I think he's probably a, a great run and chase linebacker, not necessarily – you're not getting you're not getting Mike Singletary in this class. You're not getting uh, 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 Patrick Willis. The the bigger guys aren't really in this class. There's a lot of the hybrid safety court or safety linebacker guys that that can turn, run, cover a little bit. Um, that's where this class is strong. You're not probably not getting the three down linebacker. I'm not sure that it exists a lot in the NFL to begin with anymore. Uh, and I don't think, you know, that the, there, there's a, a, a preponderance of guys in this class that will do that for you either. You mentioned Campbell, who I think is interesting. Is he one of the guys that you think can be uh, one of the few guys that can be a two-way tight end, a two-way tight end, two-way linebacker in this class? Yeah, because in part because he can go out and cover a tight end, but he can also stay in the box and be an asset and run defense. The big thing with him is Iowa protected him all time with a very good defensive line. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if your NFL team can't do that, how well does he fit that for you? And there, there's a few guys that fall into that that box this year. Uh, the you know okay, the defensive line that was in front of them was great, kept them clean, and they were free to run around. Overshown somewhat of that. And as, I as imagine kind of Trent Sis- Trent Simpson's probably in that category too, right out of Clemson. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Trent Simpson is a guy. He there's some missed tackles on film for him. There's some missed assignments on film for him. Uh, I think he's going to go higher than I will probably rank him. He's a very heady player, um, but he he also uh, one of the big things that I watch when I'm watching linebackers is body control. Um, and Jared Davis relates to this. He can get from point A to point B really fast, but if he's got to go from point B to point C quickly, can he get there? I don't necessarily see that with Trenton Simpson. I see a lot of overshot angles, uh, and those worry me uh, as as a guy that you know watches linebackers. Um, in Detroit, Cleveland, and Houston do that very consistently over the last few years. <laughs> Can you stop yourself? Do you have the body control where the, the running back's going to make a cut? Can I get him on the ground from where I'm at? Uh, do I fire too early? Uh, that's something that, that you see. Um, uh, I'm looking at the linebacker. I can see him. He's coming out of uh, Pene, uh, Pene Sewell's brother. Noah, Noah Sewell. Yeah. Does that all the time. He triggers early and gets beaten because of it. Uh, that's a guy that's probably going to get overhyped by, I think, a lot of the draft class. If he wa- if his name wasn't Sewell, I'm not sure that he's a top 100 prospect, but I think you're still going to see a lot of people projecting him in the late first, early second round. I, his game doesn't have that. I, it just doesn't for me. All right, one of the linebackers I want to throw it out to you is the Alabama one, Henry Toa Toa, a guy we haven't talked about much. Break yeah. him down for me. Uh, very smart guy, and he his play in space got better. Uh, another guy that's very well protected by his defensive line. I did see things from him that I like. I, th- I think he started to see the field better in, in his final season. And we didn't get to see him down in Mobile. That was a little bit disappointing. Uh, he He's a perfectly capable starting linebacker. I'm not sure there's ever going to be more than that, though. Like, do you, do you want a guy who's going to be an impact player? That's probably not him. But do you need a guy that can come in, reliably cover a tight end or, you know, pick up a running back on a Texas route and, and terminate the player right away. I think he's going to be very good at doing that. Very good. All right, let's jump uh, to the edge players. And, you know, you're going to have some hybrid guys in this group too. Is Will Anderson, like if he was in last year's class, is he going before Hutchinson? Is he going before Thibodeau? Is he going before Trayvon Walker? Uh, based on his tape this year, and obviously you could look at his 2021 tape too, obviously. And then after that, who are some of the edge guys you like if the Giants want to try to supplement what they have with uh, Kayvon Thibodeau and Aziz Ojolari? Yeah, you're Anderson for me uh, is a he's not a cut and dry evaluation. He's not a surefire top five prospect for me. Uh, I there are gaps in his production. There are times where he looks like he's going through the motions, um, where he's a little bit too content to be blocked for a guy with his ridiculous athleticism, or what we're led to believe is his ridiculous ridiculous athleticism. Look, he's going to be one of the top five picks in, in the draft i have very little doubt about that um there's he's not the slam dunk that i think a lot of people think he is now when, when you're getting you're getting to that next tier um and guys that that could possibly interest the the giants later on you know it, again do you want a guy that's more like ojulari as, as sort of a i don't want to call him one note because i think that's that's underselling him but a, a speed rusher a guy who's going to win primarily outside or working, you know, off of a guy that's inside him in, in a tandem type of combination, or, or are you going to get a guy like Thibodeau that you know is hopefully the alpha rusher that you need, a guy that you know dictates? Okay, I got to have my tight end come over here. It's not a great year for the pass rushers, to be honest with you. Um, and and you know, you see Miles Murphy as a guy that's listed. I'm not his biggest fan. Uh, it's it's just not that exciting of a, of a rush class, you know. Down in in we saw Derek Hall out of Auburn, pretty intriguing guy. If that guy ever figures out to turn the Bluetooth off and actually use his hands in his pass rush, he's going to be good. But he's not there yet, you know. Uh, th- th- there's a few of those guys that okay, let let let's see you cover up your fatal flaw as a pass rusher right now. Uh, and may, uh, Isaiah Foskey, another guy out of Notre Dame physical guy can win over either shoulder, but he, he loves to spin move and stop. And I don't like that, but we, it, it showed up. I, I live close enough to Notre Dame. I get to go to their games. Saw him at Stanford, the Stanford game. He did that twice where 
he's got the guy beat, but he he waits to feel where the where the which way to spin out of it. He's just turning his back into the blocker. He doesn't always make the right decision. It doesn't always come out of it with the burst that you need. So it's it, there's a lot of day two guys that are going to be like Ojolari, a complimentary rusher. I don't think you're finding many alpha dogs in this class. One of the two guys I want to throw at you is, is Tyree Wilson and Lucas Van Ness. So I think people love their athleticism, but the, just having there's so many guys where you see potential, Jeff, but the the, yeah. the production isn't quite there yet. And the one thing that tends to carry over from from college to pros is pass rush production. And I just don't think we have that elite production, even if we do have some guys like you mentioned. Miles Murphy's got tools, right? A lot of guys have tools, and I want you to talk about Wilson and Van Ness specifically, but yeah. we just haven't seen it turn into you know, this guy's a really good pass rusher. Yeah. And Wilson, again, the, the 36 plus inch arms, uh, he, he, he's a guy, he just have a, a great deal of twitch to him. I'm not going to say that he's stiff because he's not, that, that, that's, that's not right. But is this guy, you know, dripping with the, the athleticism to win consistently on the outside? Uh, he's a guy that I would love in, in, in a role where you're playing an odd man front or you're playing him as your fourth lineman and you play him over the tackle. I don't want him. I don't want him outside uh, because if you're playing a, a, an offensive tackle with quick hands, he's going to be able to neutralize him. Uh, and, and his length is almost it's almost too long. Um, as weird as it is to say that, you know, coming from it, I'm a volleyball player by trade. That's that's what I did when I before my body quit. Um, and there's a point <laughs> of diminishing returns with height and length in volleyball. And I think you see that in with defensive ends as well. Um, and offensive tackles, by the way, but less more so with the the super long guys. Like it just takes so long to get your arm and hand out there. And if you miss or you don't win that initial battle, what do you have left? And that's the question that I have with Wilson. Van Ness is a guy, look, Iowa, we're talking about Iowa and their weird program again. I think some of what he does does translate very well. And and you're gonna see athleticism out of him, but I I have a hard time not seeing um, the guy and, and it's killing me because he's from my hometown of Zealand, Michigan. Uh, and he was in last year's Zach Van Valkenburg. He's, he's a much better athlete than Zach was, but does he have that transcendent athleticism? Does he have the, the, the technical prowess to go make an impact at the NFL right now? I think NFL draft analysts are writing a lot of checks that I don't think Van Ness can cash just yet. Now maybe he will in 2024, 2025 once he gets his feet wet, but I I I don't see that top end prospect that a lot of people are writing him up to be. You know, yeah, I've seen him like in be. the top twelve in some of these mock drafts. I, and I'm like, I, I don't get like, that. He wasn't at even all. a starter. In Iowa. Yeah. he played inside a lot. Uh, Jeff, I'm, I'm I'm with you on that. Yeah, uh, uh, he's, he could very well be a good football player, but I'm not getting the hype on it. He's he's in that. 50 to 80 overall range for me right now. And I have, I have seen him play in person. Um, what little he did play. I, I, I don't, I don't get it, man. I just don't. All right, let's go to defensive tackle. We'll wrap up here. And I guess it's fitting that we saved this one for last because I think maybe the best player in the class might be at defensive tackle. And amazingly, maybe the best player on the Georgia defense, the last two years, which has been one of the you know best defenses in, in the history of college football, to be quite frank with you, Jalen Carter's phenomenal. You could, you know, give me your, little view yeah. on him and then how does the rest of this group kind of play out because uh they're i don't know jeff i'm just not sure about it yeah uh jalen carter's number one for me uh number one overall for me and that doesn't mean you take him number one overall because there's some positional value there uh uh look i i watched and dama at nebraska i watched him come up with the lions He's as close to Andamak and Sue as I've seen from a prospect. And that's certainly worthy of a premium pick. He's got the attitude. He's got the strength. He's got the, the agility. He's got the football IQ. Pretty much a complete package. It's You're going to be nitpicking if you're looking for faults with Jalen Carter. Uh, that next year, though, Brian Breesey, a guy, a guy that, my goodness, he's been mocked to the Detroit Lions at six and at 18. He's not there for me. He's a guy the Jeff, I don't see a, it. No, I, I didn't good know. His good I, tape I is watch, good. I didn't watch the tape from last year, and I know people tell me that is better, and I got to go back and look. I know he went through a lot of personal tragedy this year and he everything did. like that, but this year, the tape, I, I I just don't see it. Clemson took him off the field in obvious running situations, and when you watch the tape, it's pretty clear why. He doesn't anchor. He's got – this is going to be a 
this will go over well. He's got a lot of Taven Bryan to him and a guy that's trying to rush the passer even on third and short uh, when, when the when the opponent's in a jumbo package. He just doesn't have that sort of grit game to him. Now, look, he's a really good interior pocket collapser, but I'm not there with him. Uh, he, I, I, I pray my Lions will take him in the first round, to be honest with you, and hope for the Giants' sake that they wouldn't take him at 25 either. That's still too high for me for what I've seen wow. from him. Interesting. All right, how about how about the rest of this group? When do you think those guys start kicking in here? Round three or late round two? You know, there's a lot of guys that I like later in day three. We saw a couple of them down in Mobile. Cameron Young out of Mississippi State is one. Uh, the, there's a lot of immovable object type nose tackles. This this is a good year to need them. Young being one of them. Uh, the, uh, there there's several, you know, and they don't necessarily look that beefy. The, the one guy I want to bring up is Cancy out of Pittsburgh, at 280 pounds. He he's going to get compared to Aaron Donald, and I hate that for him because he's nobody's Aaron Donald. He's a really, really good guy at winning off the snap and winning the first combat. He does it consistently. He does it with his feet. He does it with his hands. He does it with his shoulders. He's he's a very intriguing guy, but I'm not sure you're going to get him at more than 282, 285 pounds where he's going to be successful in the NFL. Where do you play that in the NFL? I don't know, man, but that that that's a good football player right there. And Jeff, you mentioned it a couple of times. The Lions have two picks here. Uh, just to give a, an idea for Giant fans, we're going to try to figure out who's going to go ahead of them in this draft here. Yeah. Uh, you guys had a hell of a year, man. You, you really closed strong. One more win a little earlier in the year. You're in the playoffs, and you know who knows the way the NFC went. So what are the Lions looking for here, and and, and what are they going to be thinking when the draft comes? And frankly, for agency comes as well, because you know, I'm sure next year the Giants in Detroit could be battling for one of those playoff spots again. Uh, I absolutely anticipate that, what you just said, by the way. I, I think the, the Lions, the Giants, uh, they're right in that same tier of emerging NFC powers. Young cores, exciting young dynamic coaches. Well, I wouldn't call Brian Di- Dable but dynamic, but he's good. He's very good at what he does. Um, Lions need a starting outside cornerback. They need to replace and upgrade the hybrid nickel role. Um, it's a safety position. Or Aaron Glenn would love it to be a safety uh, last year it was Will Harris who couldn't play safety at all. They put him in the slot. Um, he might be back, but they need somebody better than that. They need a starting right guard. They need a quarterback, not replacing Jared Goff, but Jared Goff is literally the only quarterback in Detroit right now. They don't they don't even have one on a futures contract. They need a developmental guy that can possibly take over if Jared Goff prices himself out of Detroit. Isn't his contract up? In. Is it after this year's contract? This up after after next year. After next year, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, but if he plays the way he did in 2022, in 2023, Jared Goff is going to need to get paid after 2023, and deservedly so. He earned that Pro Bowl spot. He was very very good down the stretch. Uh, he hasn't thrown an interception since week nine. Uh, and, and played every snap since then. Very impressive Jared Goff, but again, you're getting into the, if he gets hurt, who's taking over for him? Uh, they need at least somebody who can come in and guide. This is a Lions team. This Lions team expects to win the NFC North next year. Maybe that's crazy, but uh, they're not going to do it if Jared Goff goes out and they're filling in X player off the street. They need a developmental guy, and they probably also need a veteran that can come in and, Go two and two if Goff misses a month with you know breaking his finger on a on a helmet or something like that. So that's a need. They do quietly need offensive line depth. They use a sixth lineman more than any other team. It is their de facto blocking tight end. They would probably like somebody that can also you know fill in as your backup tackle. Uh, the guys that they have aren't all that great at it right now. Uh, you're looking at a defensive tackle. They need a nose tackle like nobody's business. Uh, they figured out that Aleem McNeil is a really good three technique, but he's not a nose tackle. Uh, so th- they're in need there. Off-ball linebacker. Lions fans will tell you it's probably the biggest need on the defense. I will tell you it's third or fourth, but it is something that they absolutely need, especially if Alex Anzalone leaves in free agency. And by the way, Alex Anzalone would look great in the middle of that New York defense. Uh, the way he played at the end of the season, he's exactly the type of guy that they're looking for. He's much better than his old college roommate and best friend, Jared Davis. Um, I don't, I don't want, I don't wish Jared Davis. Look, I love Jared Davis. Great dude. I don't want to play on my football team. 
And by the way, I thought it was huge. You guys got your offensive coordinator back. I thought, I think he's literally one of the best play callers in the whole league. Wonderful we got him for player. one more year. Um, and we're very happy to have Ben Johnson back. His, his creativity. Um, we have the chicken versus egg conversation all the time of how important he is for Jared Goff. Right. Um, and Jared Goff, they have a lot of weapons in Detroit. And I wrote it this morning at Lions Wire for whenever you read it. Please check this out. Do not mock a first round tight end of the Detroit Lions just because they traded TJ Hawkinson in the year. They traded TJ Hawkinson because they don't need a great tight end in Ben Johnson's offense. And they certainly weren't going to pay TJ Hawkinson to be in. It is a need. It's a much lesser need than what's being ballyhooed nationally. And by the way, two first round picks, and you almost have a third one because Jamison Williams is going to be a full time player next year. You know, he barely yeah. played for you guys last year. And when he did, he looked great. One catch. One catch. And he, yeah. I mean, he is the perfect complement to, you know, kind of your possession receiver and Amon Ross St. Brown. So, you know, <laughs> lines are going to be good, man. I'm, I'm very happy for you. Much like with the Giants, it's been a long time coming, Jeff. It is. Uh, it's been a very long time coming. Uh, I'm 50 years old and they've won one playoff game in my lifetime. Uh, I'm, re I'm ready for more. And I, I dare say it. I'm very optimistic about where this team is going with the young core. I love Dan Campbell, love the coaching staff that he's assembled around him. It was the youngest team in the NFL. They started four rookies on defense last year. It's obviously got to get better. Their defense was absolutely train wreck abysmal early in the season Second half of the year, I don't think people caught on to this. They were quietly a top 10 defense in the last eight weeks. And that includes the abysmal game that cost them the playoff berth, um, where Carolina ran for 300 and some odd yards and, and did it with Sam Darnold running the read option. <laughs> that one still kills me. Those, can't, those kind of games can't happen again. But, yeah, it's a good time to be a Detroit Lions fan, as it's a good time to be a New York Giants fan. Arrow's pointing up for both these franchises, man. Well, I would love nothing more than to be in New York or Detroit next year, and we're talking about an NFC playoff game between these two teams. That'd be a lot of fun. That, that could happen. Oh, absolutely. All right, Jeff, tell the folks where they get Now that you've kissed to death both franchises, thank you for that. Um, can, <laughs> tell the folks where they can find all your stuff, man. Yeah, uh, my Lions-related stuff is at LionsWire at usatoday.com. Uh, you can find my draft and general NFL stuff at RealGM, footballrealgm.com. Um, they also have a very vibrant Knicks discussion there. Uh, if, if you're a basketball guy, uh, please check that out. And you can also find me on the, the, the Detroit Lions podcast. Easy for me to say. We talk a lot of Lions. But we also talk a great deal of draft. And we have some great draft video prospect shorts that are going on there uh, that myself and Scott Bischoff are running. Uh, so check those out. And uh, if you ever happen to be in the Michigan area, turn on your radios to the huge show. Uh, I am on there very regularly uh, in the huge show across Michigan uh, based on a 96 one in Grand Rapids. Awesome. Jeff, good to talk to you, man. And we'll see you in Indy for the combine. We'll talk some combine. All right. I can't wait to drive down there. It's, it's, it's a three. I literally, I'm looking out my window right now. I turn left. I turn left again and I go 200 miles South and I'm at the combine. I can't wait to see you down there. The Giants little podcast is brought to you by PSC and G energy efficiency for game time. At any time, visit PSEG.com slash giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Great draft primer from Jeff Risden. We'll see him in Indy. Jeff, good stuff. We'll talk to you then folks. We'll see you next time on the Giants little podcast.